Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We can confess that we have turned from you, and giving ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry. together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ your sins are forgiven. Almighty God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
Praise to you, O God, who lives with us, sharing our flesh and bones. As Mary waited and Joseph dreamed, so we wait and dream for you. Bless us and let your face shine upon us, more radiant than these candles and more dear than all else we seek. Restore us when we fail to refuse the evil and choose the good and banish all our fears. We pray in the name of Emmanuel, your promised child and our savior. Amen. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Augsburg Lutheran Church on this fourth Sunday of Advent. I'm Pastor Joe Yuha. It's a blessing to be here with you this day. Um, a reminder, this is our only fourth Sunday in Advent service at 11. If you would like to come back, we'll be doing a service of lessons and carols, so it'll be a totally different service. Stick around if you want. A big thank you to our handbells for playing. This is the first time they've played in quite a while, so... Really excited to have them back this morning. A couple things out in uh, the gathering area. There is an angel tree, so stop by that if you have not yet. And we also have extra copies of the time and talent form. If you have not filled one out and turned it in, please prayerfully consider doing so. Then finally, you are invited to join us this Saturday and Sunday for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We will have our family Christmas Eve service at 1.30. It is tentatively scheduled to be outdoors. The weather is not looking promising. It's going to be pretty cold, so we'll let you know about that. That's at 1.30, and then we'll have candlelight services here at 7.30 and 10.30 with music beginning 30 minutes in advance of each. And then we will have one, one service next Sunday on Christmas Day at 10.30 a.m. So mark your calendars. Join us as we prepare for the birth of our Savior. Our service continues as we hear God's word.
reading from Isaiah. The Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The word of the Lord. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the Lord, as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So maybe I'm a little out of date here, but I feel like there's been a big recent uptick in interest in ancestry. You know, genealogy, genealogy your heritage. Where do you come from? Thanks to places like Ancestry.com, 23andMe, and a whole host of other tests and information, you can find out basically anything you want to know about where you come from. And I suppose we use that information to better our lives, or at least influence it. I mean, I've discovered that my earliest ancestor to come over on my dad's side's name was Rudolph Rudolph. Neither of our twins are going to be named Rudolph. (laughs) I have a friend who gave his father an ancestry test and was surprised when his father flat out refused to take it for quite some time. See, he has a French last name and he had put so much pride into having French heritage, he was afraid that if he took that test, it would undermine the pride that he'd carried for decades. Well, he ended up taking the test and turns out he was French, so it's all good. But our past and even... The fear of our past affects our future. We'll come back in a minute to talking about ancestry, but let's look at the dilemma that Joseph faces in his present time in our gospel today, summed up by, uh uh-oh, his fiancée Mary is pregnant, and we hear that he's a righteous man, so we can infer that that baby is not his. So what do you do if you're Joseph? 
Well, again, he's a righteous man, so there's no way he can stay engaged to her, right? Especially not in the culture he lived in. There's something suspicious going on, so he's going to just break off the engagement in a quiet way, and it will be over, leaving Mary out of the public eye. I'm sure he agonized over that decision for days. And so he finally comes to his decision. He goes to bed with a clear conscience. And of course, as soon as that happens, an angel of the Lord appears to him in his sleep and says, you got to change your mind. Don't you just hate when that happens? When you agonize over something, trying to pick the right path, make the correct decision, be the virtuous one. Then once you've made your decision, circumstances totally outside your control come in and upend everything, pulling the rug out from under your plans, forcing you to rethink it all. I'm not saying that's God's will every time, but nonetheless, in this new reality, on this new path, you still have to try and figure out what is God's will for this new path. Try and figure out how to be or recover the righteousness you were seeking in your decision. And it'd be nice if an angel of the Lord showed up to you in your dream, right? Right after your world's been rocked and told you exactly what God wanted you to do. Well, that's not usually the case. So you have to pick up the pieces and move on as best you can. So that's what Joseph does here, right? Picking up the pieces, moving on, carrying forward probably absorbing a lot of shame in the process. Why does he do it? Just because an angel told him to do it doesn't mean that everyone, especially the religious leaders of the time, will recognize it's the right thing to do. Is he seeking to uphold the righteousness? Whoop, there's that word again. The righteous tradition of his ancestors as laid out right before the gospel we read today? Well, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked me. Every year, I try to go to the Festival of Homiletics, a conference put on by Luther Seminary, which brings in great preachers from all Christian traditions across the country. Some give lectures, some give sermons, all try to encourage us preachers who attend the conference to get better. A few years ago, I was surprised that one of the speakers at the conference was the Catholic priest from the huge Catholic church about two minutes from where I grew up in Richmond, Virginia. I decide to go to his sermon. I get there and discover he's preaching on the verses right before our gospel today, Matthew 1, 1 to 17, the genealogy of Jesus. My first thought, there could not be a more boring section of scripture to preach from. An account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob, and so on. My second thought was, well, I suppose I have heard that Catholic sermons are boring, so great, here we are. Then the priest actually started to preach, and he went through a great many of those names in the genealogy of Joseph, earthly father to Jesus. Jacob, remember when he tricked his brother, lied to his father, and stole a birthright that wasn't his? Judah and Tamar from Genesis 38. All I'll say about that is go read Genesis 38. You'll see why we don't read their story on Sunday morning. David, father of Solomon by, ooh, her name's not even written here, but it does say she's the wife of Uriah. Hmm, so there was something not so righteous there. Ahaz from 2 Kings and Isaiah that we read today, known as one of the most wicked kings of Israel, didn't do what God told him and asked for a sign today. Offered his son as a burnt sacrifice to Moloch. He did a lot more. I'll stop there. I think you get the point. There's a lot of horrible things that happened because of these not-so-righteous ancestors of Joseph, father of Jesus. And that's the point, the Catholic priest said, concluding his sermon that stuck with me for years. They messed up. Those people made the wrong choice. They did atrocious things, not just to strangers, but to their own family. And yet God saw fit not only to have them among his chosen people, but God's own son was descended from their line. If God could have those people in God's family tree, the priest said, who are we to exclude anyone from our church family? Amen. I walked out of that room stunned by this, what I thought was going to be boring passage, 
but what turned out to be one of the most convicting gospel messages I've ever heard. And it leads me to this passage today. Joseph didn't have to be righteous in his relationship to uphold any sort of ancestral honor. There's plenty of folks in his family tree who ruined that image a long time ago, and they're still considered godly. So there would have been ultimately no shame, right, if Joseph had put Mary out like the religious leaders would have expected, because God certainly didn't approve of a lot that happened in his family tree. And yet... Here we are. But Joseph didn't do that because he wasn't seeking to uphold any sort of righteous tradition. I think instead Joseph listened and Joseph acted because he discovered a new meaning of what it meant to be righteous. The righteousness of Joseph isn't based on appearing to have always made the correct choice. This righteousness that Joseph chose wasn't founded on deciding and declaring that God has only one way of thinking always and forever, and anyone who thinks otherwise is wrong. This righteousness that Joseph embraced was one that surely got him called all kinds of names by his religious peers, and yet he persisted. The righteousness that Joseph upheld was the belief that God might work in ways that go against the Christian majority. But when God speaks, who are we to argue? As we celebrate God's righteousness born among us this week on Christmas, what does it look like for you and me to follow in that way of silent Joseph and choose to follow that righteousness? What might it look like when all our well-laid plans go haywire and our choices are undermined to really seek God's will in that, not choose the easy fallback standard way of operating? What might it look like for us to be rocked like Joseph was that faithful night in his sleep by God saying, hey, the way of my son Jesus, you know, Joseph, the one you're going to call your son in just a little bit, The way of my son Jesus may go against everything you think you know about moral righteousness. Christmas is commonplace for us today, but 2,000 years ago it shattered everything the people thought they knew about God and God's righteousness. I pray that in this Christmas season that your experience of Christmas may be similar. Merry Christmas.
prepare for the fullness of Christ's presence. We pray for a world that yearns for new hope. Awaken the global church to the urgent needs of our time. Break down barriers of culture and custom and unite people of all faith in your redemptive and healing work. We pray and sing. judge the nations, beat our weapons into tools for serving the neighbor, strengthen the resolve of all who work for an end to war, fill those who hunger, comfort the grieving and attend to those in distress, bring help and hope to any who are sick or needing your care, especially this day we pray for Chris Omarini, Gray Boyette, Jasper Martin, Emily Wolner, Keith Bauman, Sarah Weyer, Sharon Schoderbeck, Terry Coda, Terry Hayworth, Tony Myers, Phyllis Adkinson, David Johnson, Patty Bissell, Kathy McAuley, Mary Catherine Cashin, Cody Hartwig, Doris Campbell, Marcus Hester, Joanne Ritchie, Barbara Florian, Harriet Cunningham, Roger Knudsen, Kathy Nelson, Julie Daub, Frank Zaniski, Aaron Dula, Morgan Moore, Linda Bacon, Kathy Liner, Lee Troutman, Marion Apel, Hank Farrar, and all those who we lift up on our lips and in our hearts. We pray and sing. mercy endures for all generations. We give thanks for the lives of the faithful who now rest in you. We trust that you will bring us into the company of all the saints with rejoicing. We especially remember Shannon St. John, Clark Comer, Jay Wise, Leah Del Wixon. We pray and sing. needs. By your spirit, gather our prayers and join them with the prayers of all your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please be seated and I'd love for any young friends to come up for our children's time. Good morning, good morning. How are you guys today? Do you know what's coming soon? Yes. No, my twins are about to be born. <laughs> yes, you're right. It's Christmas. Christmas is coming soon. And so we hear the beginning of that story today. And it's not really about baby Jesus. And it's not really about Mary. This year we hear about... Yes, Joseph! That, uh... <laughs> Thanks, Ada Catherine. We get to hear about Joseph. So this, is, this song doesn't really go with this Joseph, but I'd like you to, we're going to sing a song, and you can repeat after me, and you can all repeat after me, okay? And then we'll talk about it in a little bit. Okay, ready? Go, 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 Joseph, you know what they say. Go, 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 Joseph, you know what they say. Go, 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 Joseph, you'll make it someday. Go, 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 Joseph, you'll make it someday. Sha-la-la, Joseph, you're still in your prime. You and your dreams are ahead of their time. You and your dreams are ahead of their time. So that's from Joseph and the Amazing Technical Air Dream Code, amazing show, not just because it's about me. Um, but uh, Joseph in the Old Testament had a dream, but Joseph from our story had a dream too. And what the angel told Joseph was, you need to be patient. Don't go ahead and do what you were thinking about doing, but you need to wait 
Go, 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 Joseph. You'll make it someday. Just be patient. You guys like to be patient? Yes, good. <laughs> I feel like we've had a lot of sermons about patience sometimes. But sometimes God interrupts our life and says, you need to go this way when we want it to go this way. So when you need to be patient, when you need a reminder that God is going with you, you can sing the Joseph song, but you can put your name in there if you want to. Go, go, go to Catherine, you know what they say. Right? <laughs> Let's pray. Dear God, yeah. go, go, go with us. Go, go, go with us. Remind us of the birth of your son. That he goes where we go. And your love follows us everywhere. Keep us patient in you. Amen. Thank you guys for coming up. You guys can go back to your seats. the beginning and the end, the giver of life. Blessed are you for the birth of creation. Blessed are you in the darkness and in the light. Blessed are you for your promise to your people. Blessed are you in the prophet's hopes and dreams. Blessed are you for Mary's openness to your will. 
Blessed are you for your son Jesus, the word made flesh. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in his death and resurrection. We look with hope for his coming. Amen. Holy God, we long for your spirit. Come among us. Bless this meal. May your word take flesh in us. Awaken your people. Fill us with your light. Bring the gift of peace on earth. Come, Holy Spirit. All praise and glory are yours, Holy One of Israel. Word of God incarnate, power of the Most High, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray.